The doom of Japan began on that day, 27 December 1941, he said as he looked back. Here was an example that General Headquarters didn't understand the war in the Pacific. His was no sudden protest. Already he had suggested to Kusaka that the six flat tops be kept together and the 4th Carrier Division added to them. This would have been an invincible armada, an unbeatable combination. The original six Pearl Harbor carriers could be used to strike the enemy, and the Ryujos and Shohos planes could be used to protect the carriers in battle. If Fuchida's reaction was predictable, so was the action of the Naval General Staff. One of that organization's conditions for approval of Operation Hawaii had been that the first air fleet would be available for the southern operation as soon as possible. This, in turn, reflected a tendency firmly rooted in Japanese thinking, the inability to exploit an unexpected advantage. Nagumo's and Kusaka's refusal to send a third attack, wave over Pearl Harbor, was only one of many examples. This sort of thing happened so often in the Pacific War that Commander Masataka Chihaya, brother of Fuchida's Pearl Harbor comrade, decided that some racial characteristic, some mysterious flaw deep in the genes, must be involved. The Japanese Navy just cannot help stopping the chase. It just cannot go the limit. Swallowing his dismay as best he could, Fuchida went with Fukudome to a champagne luncheon at the official residence of Navy Minister Admiral Shigetaro Shimada. An impressive array of top brass attended. They called upon Fuchida to explain the Pearl Harbor operation, which he did in much greater detail than he had for the Emperor. The following day, 28 December, he briefed an assembly of several princes of the imperial family and their wives. It was an awe-inspiring gathering, for most of the princes were members of the armed forces in full uniform, and their wives were wearing the beautiful national kimono. Having just faced the emperor, Fuchida was not as nervous as he might have been in other circumstances. Moreover, the event took place under the sponsorship of his Etajima classmate, Commander Prince Takamatsu, then a member of the operations section of the Naval General Staff. Quite aside from his royal blood, the prince was a first-rate officer, clear-headed, professional, and popular with his colleagues. That night at the Navy Club, Fuchida gave an interview to one of Tokyo's leading correspondents. After being censored by Commander Toshikazu Omae of the Navy Ministry, it appeared in English on 2nd January 1947 in the Foreign Office's mouthpiece, The Japan Times and Advertiser. Entitled, Brilliant Account of Hawaii Bombing attack given in report by Air Squadron Commander. It identified Fuchida only as Commander X of the Japanese Navy. How much of the story was genuine, Fuchida, and how much lily painting on the part of an over enthusiastic reporter or censor is questionable. Fuchida was an articulate speaker who illustrated his rapid fire narratives by gesturing with his arms and his long expressive fingers. His language was usually straightforward. Much of the newspaper story was uncharacteristically grandiloquent. At last, he was free to snatch a few days' leave to visit Kashiwara, where Haruko was staying with the children at her girlhood home. At eight years of age, Yoshia was old enough to sense the doubt some Japanese felt about what Japan was getting into by taking on giant powers. But the townspeople did not allow such considerations to influence their joy in the military victory. Yoshia's father was the hero of the hour, and the boy glowed with pride. Miyako didn't quite know what all the fuss was about, but she too was proud to walk beside her father as he strolled down the street in his smart navy uniform. Whenever a passing soldier or sailor saluted him, Miyako raised her small hand to her forehead in imitation of her father's acknowledging salute. The citizens overwhelmed him with courtesy and honours. He addressed a packed house of about 4,000 in the Kashiwara Auditorium, telling them in general terms about the Pearl Harbour attack. They cheered him vociferously. The adulation of the populace, the approval of his superiors, the admiration of his comrades in arms, the devotion of his wife, the adoration of his children. It was a rich, creamy dish that life set before Fuchida in those days. And he lapped it up. Fond as he was of his family, he was never sorry to slip back into the harness. Soon he returned to his duties. He still brooded about the proposal to break up the first air fleet, 
but he told himself that Yamamoto would soon put an end to it. Imagine his intense disappointment and disillusionment when he discovered that Yamamoto not only failed to protest, he agreed with the idea. At that time, Fuchida loved and admired Yamamoto above all men. After this decision, he had to admit to himself that the Admiral, although sympathetic toward the naval air arm, did not comprehend the ramifications of the new force he himself had done so much to encourage. Fuchida began to think that the formation of the first air fleet had been a freak of nature, a two-headed calf and not an evolutionary step forward. Pearl Harbor had been only a sideshow. Yamamoto was deeply committed to the supremacy of the southern operation. Fuchida did not disagree with Japan's driving ambition to extend the empire over Malaya, the Philippines and the Netherlands East Indies. Japan desperately needed the raw resources of that vast treasure house, and he saw no reason why his country should not take them if it had the strength to do so. But Japan's strategists seemed to be taking the hard road. Fuchida, along with Gender and a few other dedicated airmen, had believed all along that the Pearl Harbor operation should have been an all-out attack, even an invasion and occupation of the Hawaiian Islands. The US Pacific Fleet formed the keystone of the Allies' power posture in the Pacific. If that fleet could be blasted out of the area or put out of action for a sufficiently long period, and if Japan held the Hawaiian chain, all other steps would require far less military effort than envisioned in Japan's southern strategy. He did not deceive himself that this would be an easy course. He realized and cautioned his flyers that they had met the Americans under unusual circumstances that did not permit a true evaluation of their fighting power. The time will come, he told them, when the combined fleet will meet the US fleet in open combat in the Pacific, and for that day everyone now must train and be prepared. The failure to follow through at Pearl Harbor was now part of the irretrievable past. But, Fuchida felt, the combined fleet could learn from this mistake and not compound the error. Before time ran out, they should go back east and finish the job. The immediate and complete destruction of the US Pacific Fleet, followed by the occupation of Oahu, if they succeeded, the United States would have to withdraw from the Central Pacific, in which case China's main lifeline would be severed and that country might have to abandon its stubborn resistance. Cut off from American supplies and reinforcements, the Philippines and Australia would wither away. France and Holland, under Hitler's heel, could not bolster their tottering Asiatic empires. Britain carried the full load in Western Europe and her far-flung possessions were stirring restively. In brief, Japan would have no need to hurry men and material to Southeast Asia. The theatre for the southern operation would have fallen by itself if the Pacific fleet had been completely destroyed, said Fuchida. This was his idea of a strategy that made sense. Now it seemed to him that Japan was preparing to fight the war in reverse. Despite the victory at Pearl Harbor and the exploits of the 11th Air Fleet's land-based planes in sinking the British men-of-war Prince of Wales and Repulse a few days later, the Navy's high command still did not understand the revolution in warfare. Its strategy was illogical even by conventional standards. Instead of sending his battleships east to seek out and destroy the major foe, Yamamoto kept the main body of the combined fleet in the inland sea, an object of amusement to Fuchida's airmen, who joked about the Hashirajima fleet. These vessels were intact and fit for battle, but according to Fuchida, they didn't do a damn thing in the early part of the war. This was a very serious mistake. The Japanese battleships were about as useless as the US battleships. They were sitting around waiting for their American counterparts to be repaired and reconditioned. No amount of personal affection for Yamamoto could get around the stupidity of this strategy. Fuchida had hoped that Yamamoto would join the main body of the intact first air fleet and sail first to Truk and then to the Marshals, positioning themselves to engage the Americans. As time passed without a move in this direction, some of the airmen, Fuchida included, asked each other, who is Japan fighting anyway? Fuchida always believed that the Japanese Navy made four major mistakes in rapid succession in the early days and weeks of the Pacific War. Not finishing the job at Pearl Harbor, breaking up the first air fleet, hoarding battleships in home waters, dispatching the major carrier force south and west instead of eastward to seek out the Americans. 
Had we gone after the US Pacific Fleet at once after Pearl Harbor, the course of the war in the Pacific would have been vastly different, Fuchida lamented in retrospect. Then there would have been no Battle of the Coral Sea, no Battle of Midway, no Guadalcanal, and the United States would have been in a hell of a fix. As if to add insult to injury, Yamamoto moved his flag early in the year from the Nagato to the new super battleship Yamato, pride and joy of the surface navy and a masterpiece of shipbuilding and armament. But where was this terror of the deep, anchored in Hashirajima Bay in the inland sea along with a number of other battleships of the main body? The Yamato symbolized the frustration of Fuchida, who referred to her as a big hotel. He waxed sarcastic about her living quarters. We in the Air Force never had such fine quarters and accommodations. Indeed, the Japanese had produced, on paper, the most formidable battleship afloat, yet at her inland sea base, and in her capacity as Yamamoto's flagship, the Yamato was scarcely more than a floating hotel and office building for the combined fleet staff. This frittering away of the Yamato's immense potential typified Japan's failure to seize advantages. One can readily understand why Fuchida thought this was no way to fight a war. Not surprisingly, the exhilaration and mystic sense of mission Fuchida had brought to the Pearl Harbor project were missing when early in January 1942, the Nagumo force sorted from Hiroshima Bay. At its heart sailed the Akagi, Kaga, Shokaku and Zuikaku. The presence of the last two flat tops betokened no change of mind in the naval general staff. Rear Admiral Chuichi King Kong Hara's 5th Carrier Division was substituting temporarily for the Soryu and Hiryu, which required replenishing and whose crews needed rest following their Wake Island adventure. This time the task force was to cover assaults in the vast area over which Japan was spreading its net of conquest. Malaya, the Philippines, the Netherlands East Indies, New Guinea, and the large islands off its eastern shore. On 22nd January, Fuchida led about 90 fighters and bombers in heavy strikes against Rabaul, the advanced Australian air base at the northern tip of New Britain Island. Rabaul had only a token garrison, and Fuchida felt like a hunter sent to stalk a mouse with an elephant gun. Hoping to find an enemy worthy of the name, he discovered neither targets nor opposition. And when his bombers could not return to their carriers with a heavy bomb load, he had to order some of them to jettison their missiles over the jungle. He felt deflated. They had wasted a large investment in time, gas and bombs, none of which Japan had to spare. Rabaul fell, as Gender put it, with ridiculous ease. The use of four carriers for such a routine mission was so obviously redundant that he thought something must have gone wrong in high places. As soon as Fuchida's plane touched down on the Akagi, he sought out Nagumo. It was ridiculous to use all of these aircraft in such an operation he informed the Admiral. When he explained the situation at Rabaul Nagumo heartily agreed. The next day, after amphibious forces of Japan's 4th Fleet landed, Nagumo sent word to Yamamoto that the task force had encountered no opposition. Yamamoto replied by ordering the carriers back to Palau, hundreds of miles westward. In Fuchida's opinion, this action only exchanged one mistake for another. Palau, a small atoll at the end of the southwestern chain of the Marianas, was over 3,000 miles from Oahu. Six weeks had elapsed since the Pearl Harbor attack, and Fuchida could not delude himself into thinking that the Americans were wasting time getting their ships back into action. The day after Fuchida's planes attacked Rabaul, aircraft from Yamaguchi's 2nd Carrier Division, Soryu and Hiryu, hit Ambon in the Netherlands' East Indies. At the same time, Japanese forces occupied Kendari on Celebes Island, rapidly putting it into commission as an airbase. For the Nagumo force, the next major action came when Yamamoto ordered the carriers to join forces with Admiral Nobutaka Kondo's two battleships and three heavy cruisers to sail to northern Australia and attack the coastal city of Darwin. The combined fleet had received a report that Allied ships had concentrated at Darwin and that reinforcements were arriving there. The raid, the top brass believed, would have a demoralising effect on Australian morale. Again, Fuchida considered the mission nonsense, not Japan's main operation. Yamamoto and Nagumo, however, believed that the Navy must cooperate with the Army to take Southeast Asia while the taking was good, and thus put Japan in the best possible strategic position. Dropping the 5th Carrier Division, 
called back to Japan to protect against American task forces that might venture near the homeland, but picking up the second carrier divi scion, the Nagumo force proceeded to its target area. The intelligence report about Darwin had made no mistake. The harbour was tailor-made for an air attack, jammed with an unusually heavy assortment of Allied shipping. Two Australian transports, a troop ship, a freighter, a corvette and a hospital ship lay in harbour on 19 February, along with an American destroyer, aircraft tender, two transports and a few other craft of various registry. Nevertheless, in Fuchida's opinion, these were small fry, not targets worthy of the first air fleet. He led his usual complement of approximately 180 planes, and by some freak of fortune they approached without the defenders receiving any warning. A cloudless sky provided excellent visibility. The Japanese inflicted severe damage to the huddled shipping, destroying about a dozen vessels, then shot up the town so thoroughly that it had to be abandoned temporarily. Fuchida did not recall seeing more than five or six Australian aircraft on the ground and in the air. Allied records indicate, however, that a force of approximately 10 American planes engaged his aircraft and that his force destroyed 18 Allied planes. Returning from this mission, Fuchida found Nagumo fired up to make a second strike against Darwin. Half amused, half irritated, Fuchida reflected that at Pearl Harbor, when Nagumo should have launched an additional attack, he could not get away fast enough. Now at Darwin, with no earthly reason to strike another time, he champed at the bit. It isn't necessary to repeat the attack, he informed the Admiral. There are no enemy forces. It isn't worth it. Again, he stressed that Japan's naval air power greatly exceeded the needs of this region. Don't swing such a long sword, he said to Nagumo, half seriously, half in jest. This struck the fancy of the airmen and became a catchword among them. They derided the quality of the opposition encountered so far, laughed and joked about poor enemy resistance or no enemy at all. Nagumo was a happy man these early days of 1942. He swaggered as he walked on deck and his hat rested on his head at a jaunty angle. Relations between him and Fuchida were rather peculiar. Personally, they got along. In fact, Nagumo loved Fuchida like a son and Fuchida felt a sincere affection for the Admiral, but professionally they generated a certain friction. Nagumo was out of his element as commander of an air fleet. As his flight commander, Fuchida had a duty to tell him the facts of life. Nagumo had gender to school him in tactics, but Fuchida actually flew the missions and saw the situation firsthand. Nagumo didn't relish Fuchida's pointing out that their more recent victories amounted to no more than snatching a fan from a geisha, to a degree, Yamaguchi egged Fuchida on. In the first place, the Admiral agreed with Fuchida's views and wanted to encourage him. In the second, he lost no love on Nagumo and didn't mind helping to administer an occasional pinprick. Fuchida admired Yamaguchi and looked forward to seeing him command the combined fleet or head the naval general staff in the future. Although not a pilot himself, Yamaguchi's aggressive nature appealed to his airmen, who thought him tops. After Darwin, the Nagumo force returned to its anchorage in Staring Bay near Kendari on Celebes to prepare and train for the invasion of Java. On the 3rd of March, Fuchida led a group of 180 planes against Chilat Jap on the southern coast, heavily damaging Allied shipping. During the mission, Fuchida's plane, with Murata at the controls, caught some flak. Fuel began to spurt from a wing tank. Murata did his best to coax the damaged aircraft over Borneo and back to the nearest Japanese base. The peaks of a high mountain range loomed ahead. To lighten the plane, they jettisoned everything not essential. These measures were not enough. Murata had to crash land in the Borneo jungle. The radio operator died instantly. Fuchida and Murata crawled away from the wreck, battered but alive. Again, Fuchida had evaded the clutches of death. After burying their fallen crewmen, the two flyers set out in search of civilization. They might have dropped out of time as well as out of the skies. The steaming jungle showed little sign of having changed since the age of the dinosaurs. If any settlements had ever existed here, jungle vegetation had long since obliterated them. Fuchida and Murata tried to get their bearings. Knowing the sea to be fairly near, they set off toward the coast where they would stand a good chance of rescue. For three days they wandered through the jungle. 
At night they climbed trees and lashed themselves to sturdy limbs. There they tried to snatch a little sleep, out of reach of the prowling animals below. At length, weary, sweltering, maddened by insects and nearly starved, they clambered up a hill. In the distance they saw the wreck of a Japanese aircraft. Hoping to find survivors and food, they hurried toward it, shouting a greeting. Only whistling, crackling sounds of the jungle answered. When they neared the aircraft, its number read 301. Our own plane, exclaimed Murata. They had walked in a circle for three miserable days and were right back where they started. This is the end, they thought. For a few minutes they sagged in discouragement, but soon they summoned up courage to leave the scene and start all over again. This time Fuchida surveyed the terrain with extreme caution. Some distance away lay a beautiful valley. It looked like a primitive garden of Eden, said Fuchida. Once again, at a moment of crisis, a voice sounded in his inner ear. This time it seemed to emanate from the valley. Come! And then from far off the men heard the roar of a waterfall. A waterfall meant a river, and rivers led to the sea. Hope strengthened their legs. About six hours later they penetrated the valley to the banks of a fast-flowing stream. They tied their valuables on top of their heads and tugged a large log into the water. On this they floated downstream, clutching its bark. Abruptly the night settled over them. The darkness came alive with the screams and chattering of strange animals and birds, with rustlings and splashings all the more ominous because the men could not see their source. Occasionally crocodiles investigated the log and its passengers, frightening them badly. Eventually the long night ended, and with it the jungle. They emerged at a point where the river joined the ocean. Close by stood a Chinese establishment of some sort, evidently a small trading post, its proprietor allowed the two Japanese to charter a junk. After securing much-needed rest and food, they sailed back to Kendari. Following the Java campaign, the Nagumo force returned to Staring Bay for refueling and to incorporate the 5th Carrier Division into the task force once more. The Kaga had scraped a reef, damaging her bottom, and had to return to Japan for repairs. The next major task for the remaining five flat tops commenced when Yamamoto ordered the Nagumo force to support the upcoming invasion of Burma. The mission was twofold, to cut off British supplies to Burma and to seek out and destroy all British fleet units operating in the Indian Ocean. The task force that sorted on 26 March 1942 headed for Ceylon looking like a reunion of Pearl Harbor veterans. Five of the original sextet of flat tops were present, the battleships Haruna and Congo were reinforcing the Pearl Harbor support ships. The battleships Kirishima and Hiei, the heavy cruisers Tone and Chikuma, and the light cruiser Abukuma, and nine destroyers prowled on the flanks. The British had a strong force in the Indian Ocean. Five battleships, three carriers, and a number of cruisers and destroyers. A direct confrontation might well throw a monkey wrench into Japan's strategic machinery. The Japanese hoped to catch the British by surprise, but could not afford to underestimate British seamen. They were like junior diplomats about to negotiate with Elizabeth Abertz in her old age, vigorous and optimistic, but wondering uneasily just how many aces the old girl had up her sleeve. She was still the Sea Queen, schooled in naval warfare, sharp as a cutlass with the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. Nagumo's luck held. On the 4th of April, the task force spotted a British reconnaissance plane. Quickly, they launched a few zeros, which made short work of the intruder. The scout, however, had had time to radio a warning, so Nagumo did not catch enemy aircraft on the ground. For all practical purposes, this made little difference. At 8 on Easter Sunday, the 5th of April 1942, Fuchida's men struck Colombo, one of Britain's main naval and air bases. They hoped to find British fleet units there. Instead, the place was larn with merchant ships. The Zeros, under Itaya's leadership, disposed of virtually every RAF aircraft that challenged them. While the aerial fight raged, dive bombers and horizontal bombers smashed the shore installations. In the harbour, the Japanese hit only an armed merchant cruiser and a destroyer, because advance warning had permitted the other craft to work up steam and escape. And though victorious, Fuchida's men paid a price. A number of aircraft failed to return to their carriers. Following the raid, Fuchida flew back to the Akagi and reported to Nagumo. 
After sketching out the results, he advised that they begin searching for any British that had fled. Nagumo agreed, and reconnaissance planes were launched at once. This search soon paid off. Around noon, the planes discovered two British heavy cruisers, the Dorsetshire and Cornwall, headed for a rendezvous with Britain's eastern feet. As Flight Commander Fuchida directed the attack, but he left the actual leadership to Egusa from the Soryu. Fuchida remained aboard the Akagi, standing by with decks full of aircraft in case another strike on Colombo was called. He busied himself preparing torpedo planes for takeoff to help dive bombers sink the heavy cruisers. It proved unnecessary to launch them. Egusa's bombardiers sank the Dorsetshire and Cornwall in what Fuchida estimated to be 20 minutes. The surface vessels did not have a chance against our striking force. It was like turning a hand, it was so easy, Fuchida later remarked. When he reported to Nagumo on the sinking of the cruisers, the admiral swelled with pride, but the surface fleet commanders were discomfited, almost angry. They didn't like the naval air arm being so powerful. This time the first air fleet's planes had sunk two men of war in motion, not trapped and immobile like the ships in Pearl Harbor. The advocates of heavy surface ship supremacy had no alibi left. Sea power had changed and a new era had begun, said Fuchida. This was the victory of naval air power. Nagumo next swung his ships around the southern end of Ceylon and headed northward to strike Trincomalee, Britain's second principal base on the island. Again, an enemy reconnaissance plane warned the defenders of the Japanese approach. Most of the ships had already sorted when by 7.25 on the 9th of April, Fuchida led his team of about 100 aircraft into action. Eleven hurricane fighters bravely rose to meet the attack. Nine paid the penalty. While the dive bombers concentrated on demolishing parked aircraft, the high-level bombers buried their missiles in shore installations. Buildings exploded in geysers of flame and smoke. The planes also sank one merchant ship. Fuchida decided to leave the remaining vessels to Egusa's second-wave dive bombers. Radioing his decision to the Akagi, he shepherded the first wave back to the carriers. Not all who had winged in would follow him. About 20 had been shot down. On the way back, he intercepted a report from one of the first air fleet's scout planes that an enemy carrier was heading south with its escort destroyer. As the first wave no longer had the firepower to tackle a flat top, Fuchida and his men sped back to their motherships. By the time Fuchida touched down, the Japanese had identified the British ships as the old carrier Hermes and her escort destroyer Vampire. This duo being a much more important target than the stray vessels in Trincomalee Harbour, Egusa was already spearheading his second wave toward the Hermes. Maintenance crews hastened to refuel and rearm Fuchida's first wave planes, fitting the level bombers with torpedoes in case they had to go to Egusa's aid. While this was going on, nine British Blenheim bombers attacked the Akagi. They inflicted no damage. Between the Zero's cover and the carrier's anti-aircraft fire, the Akagi destroyed five of the Blenheims and damaged the rest. Leaving his bombers aboard the carrier, Fuchida led a group of Itaya's fighters in pursuit of Igusa, in case he required assistance against the Hermes's interceptors. But Igusa did not need help. He had about 80 dive bombers, nearly all of which had direct hits on the Hermes. When Fuchida arrived, the carrier was already sinking, lost within 15 or 20 minutes of the first bomb. He noticed Lieutenant Shokei Yamada, who led the Akagi's dive bombers, gesticulating urgently, so Fuchida flew alongside his plane. Yamada pointed at his nose, then downward, and smiled. Fuchida followed the finger, and there below him the vampire trembled in her death throes. Then Fuchida understood. Yamada had set his heart on bombing the carrier, and rather than waste his bomb had dropped it on the destroyer instead. When Fuchida saw how easily his airmen had sunk a British carrier and destroyer, Again, he reflected to himself, We are using too much power on secondary missions. The first air fleet should be in the Pacific, fighting the number one enemy. While his radio man took official pictures, Fuchida Aubert served the action. How powerful is the Imperial Navy? He exclaimed inwardly as he watched Hermes sink under the hail of bombs. He who controls the air controls the sea and the world. Conventional Navy vessels do not have a chance against air power. It is sad to see them sink so helplessly. Something like nostalgia seized Fuchida. This is the end of the British Empire and British sea power, he mused. 
What a pity, an era of world history lay dying before his eyes. Japan's first great naval vessels had been built in British shipyards, its first instructors hailed from Britain. The very bricks of the Naval Academy at Etajima were baked in British kilns. The British were not popular in Asia, but no one could deny they were expert seamen and brave fighters. How strange that Fuchida, a navy man who loved the sea, had helped write this sad chapter in the saga of British sea power. The Indian Ocean campaign over, Kondo and Nagumo turned prows eastward en route to Japan for refurbishing and refueling. Fuchida was glad to leave the area where the Nagumo force had been wasting its time. The first air fleet's support of the southern operation had cost Japan more than squandered days and weeks. Every raid took its toll of planes and flyers. Airmen for Nagumo's fleet were virtually hand-picked, being either combat veterans or the cream of the young crop. When one of these precision instruments crashed, it left a gap in Japan's shortest of all short supplies, skilled manpower. Moreover, as it worked out, time, fuel and personnel losses were just enough that a full carrier complement would not be available for the Battle of the Coral Sea. Only the Shokaku and Zuikaku, and because of their participation in that battle, the Shokaku would suffer severe damage and the Zuikaku would have to be restocked and remanned. They would miss the Battle of Midway. Though unquestionably the Nagumo force had scored tactical victories, they were links in a chain reaction of disaster. No such thoughts troubled Fuchida's air crews as the carriers steamed toward Japan. Confident that they could beat all comers anywhere at any time, they swaggered about singing and wise cracking. These young men had not only fulfilled their assigned missions brilliantly, they were going home to bask briefly in their family's love and to sip the heady brew of public acclaim. As intoxicated with success as the greenest airman, Nagumo beamed on them all with paternal gratification. Who shall say he did not have just cause? Beginning with Pearl Harbor, he had racked up an awesome score, while enemy action had not sunk or even damaged a single ship under his command. With the hopes of Japan nailed to his masthead, he had written in fire a record few sea captains ever compile in a lifetime. En route to Japan, the first air fleet stopped at Singapore, just a few months before the city had been proclaimed Great Britain's outpost of the Empire, the Gibraltar of the Orient. Yet the Japanese had plucked this plum with comparative ease. During his stay, Fuchida paid his respects to Vice Admiral Jisaburo Ozawa, in command of Japan's naval forces in that area. As his only flat-top strength consisted of the lightweight 4th Carrier Division, the Shoho and Ryujo, Ozawa was glad to see the first air fleet. Fuchida hastened to reassure him. You needn't worry, he said. Your 4th Carrier Division is strong enough to take care of the Indian Ocean now. Sure of a sympathetic ear, for Ozawa was a long-time friend as well as a solid proponent of air power, Fuchida spoke of his displeasure with Japan's naval strategy. What's the difference? he asked, between the US battleship force destroyed or damaged in Pearl Harbor and the Japanese battleship force anchored in the inland sea doing nothing. It looks as though we want the US Pacific fleet built up again before we go out to strike it. We're wasting time. We must go east as soon as possible and attack the main enemy. But Ozawa refused to be drawn. Like most of Japan's top naval brass, he thought largely in terms of the southern operation. Once more homeward bound, the first air fleet received orders detaching the 5th Carrier Division, which was to sail to Truk in anticipation of the struggle for Port Moresby. This developed into the Battle of the Coral Sea. The rest of Nagumo's carriers proceeded as scheduled. As they plunged through the China Sea, Fuchida continued to fret that the United States was growing stronger every minute Japan frittered away. To his relief, on the cruise back to Japan, the brass finally began to consider future operations against the US Navy. He wholeheartedly supported a plan called the BEI Go Shadan Sakusen, the United States, Australia cutoff operation. The strategy, which originated in the Naval General Staff, called for a campaign in the Fiji area to isolate Australia from the United States. This accomplished, the Japanese Navy would keep moving eastward and eventually occupy Hawaii. Originally, Yamamoto was receptive to this idea, but two events settled his future strategy and ruled out the operation, the Doolittle Raid against Japan and the Battle of the Coral Sea. 
The uninterrupted chant of Japanese victory struck a sour note on 18 April 1942. Early that morning, a picket boat on patrol duty sighted Vice Admiral William F. Halsey's task force moving toward Japan. Nagumo's force received the news approximately midway between Formosa and the Philippines. An order came through from the combined fleet to chase an American force consisting of a carrier, a cruiser, and some destroyers located about 800 miles off Japan. Nagumo and Fuchida blazed with anticipation. Here was our real enemy, the U.S. Navy, reflected Fuchida, especially carriers, the warships we wanted to destroy the most. Of course, Japanese planners had anticipated that the Americans would try to bomb the homeland, but they estimated that a carrier must come within a 300-mile circle of the target before launching. Otherwise, the attackers would be too far offshore to recover their planes. Therefore, Nagumo and his airmen were sure that they had at least a full day's grace. With any kind of luck, they might intercept the American task force in time either to prevent the raid or to exact revenge for it. The Akagi, Soryu and Hiryu sped toward the estimated American course at 24 knots. Then reports came in from Tokyo that American B-25 bombers had attacked the home islands. Where had these land-based bombers come from? Fuchida wondered. He knew of no base remaining in American hands nearer than Midway, and that was too far away. The B-25s could not have been launched from a carrier. A raid by naval aircraft must still be in the making. So the Nagumo force continued to pour on the oil. Gender was not aboard the Akagi to participate in the excitement and discussions, for he had temporarily parted company with the first air fleet at Singapore. He flew back to Japan, landing at Iwakuni that very day, 18 April, but it is doubtful if he could have added anything constructive. Even he, with his far-ranging mind, had never hit upon the idea of launching army bombers from a carrier, nor had anyone else in the Japanese Navy. But that was precisely what the Americans had done. Thanks to the tactic, the Hornet only had to come within 700 miles of Japan, well out of range of Japanese land-based fighters. It also threw the air raid defense off schedule, because the defenders expected the American planes to appear on the 19th. There were some Japanese fighters patrolling at about 10,000 feet, but Lieutenant Colonel James H. Jimmy Doolittle's 16 B-25s flew in at roughly 150 feet, right under the fighters. They bombed Tokyo, Yokosuka, Nagoya and other locations, causing relatively little damage. In Tokyo, they also strafed, accidentally machine-gunning two grammar school students, their deaths formed the core of the prosecution of the captured members of Doolittle's raiding party. The following day, Japanese headquarters at Shanghai informed Tokyo that two US bombers had crashed not far from Hankou. Then, Japanese airmen realized that the raid was a true one-way attack. Army bombers could take off from a carrier deck, but there was no way they could land on one. Obviously, Nagumo would not be able to run down a task force already steaming far to the east. Yamamoto ordered Nagumo to abandon the chase and proceed to Hashirajima. By this time, the first air fleet had almost reached Yokosuka, so Nagumo turned it around and sailed for the inland sea, minus the Akagi, which went on to Kur. Fuchida and his flyers admired the valor of the Doolittle pilots. Previously, they had not credited the Americans with having so much courage. The raid also fascinated Fuchida. He felt an affinity with those Americans who, like his own Pearl Harbor team, had not hesitated to fly into the tiger's den. Through the war and after it, he made a special study of the operation. He had more regard for the brave men who had bombed Japan than for the Japanese army responsible for defending it. He had little use for or faith in the army. In this instance, army spokesmen announced that the raid had done no damage and that army fighters had shot down nine of the attacking planes. Fuchida knew quite well that not a single B-25 had been brought down over Japan. Later, he learned that the wrecks of two B-25s that crashed in China had been hauled to Tokyo and piled in front of the Yasukuni Shrine as evidence that the army had indeed bagged enemy bombers as claimed. To thus use the most sacred shrine of Japan's honored dead shocked Fuchida to the core. He was ashamed that the army would so mislead the Japanese people. The armed forces hushed up the Doolittle incident. For many in Japan, the raid caused only a ripple of interest. But the whole truth could not be hidden. 
In Tokyo, especially, it came as a great surprise to citizens who until then had heard about nothing but one Japanese victory after another. Nor had the general public been alerted to expect hit-and-run raids, which the armed forces always believed might occur. Some were a bit disillusioned with the Navy for letting Americans sail so close to the sacred shores. Little wonder that Yamamoto received a few nasty letters with his usual laudatory fan mail. The Doolittle raid hurt Yamamoto's pride, reminisced Fuchida. He loved the Emperor and wanted to ensure his safety in Tokyo, so he determined there must never be another Doolittle raid on Tokyo again. Between wounded vanity and anxiety over the Emperor's safety, Yamamoto lost his judgment. He hastened to initiate the strategy that led to the Japanese disaster at Midway. As mentioned, work had recently started on a strategy to sever all communications between the United States and Australia, blocking General Douglas MacArthur's supply of men and materiel so that eventually he would wither on the vine. Under those circumstances, the Americans would not be able to move up from Australia into New Guinea and then to the Philippines. The plan called for Nagumo's airmen to attack Allied airbases near Canberra, to bomb Sydney Harbour and all the naval vessels therein, indeed to hit every worthy target available in eastern Australia.